Honorable Mayor of Mexico City, Mr. Marcelo Ebrard Casabon, <coughs> Mayor of Paris, the Honorable Mr. Bertrand Delano, Executive Director of UN Habitat, Mr. Johan Kloss, Your Excellency, Madame Patricia Espinoza Cantilano, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico, Distinguished Mayors, Ladies and Gentlemen, May I say it's a great privilege to be here at this remarkable event. This is clearly an inspiring moment because this gives you the feeling that irrespective of what happens globally, and I'm sure much will happen globally, the strength of anything that the world does to meet the growing challenge of climate change has to come from the towns and cities. I'd like to pay my tribute to the Mayor of Mexico for having put together this remarkable, remarkable event. May I also say, sir, that I am deeply admiring of your leadership of this beautiful city. Mexico City is not only a conglomeration of people, buildings, and physical infrastructure. It is a city with a soul. It is a city with energy. It's vibrant with so much culture and strength. And it's a great privilege to be here. Mayor Delano of Paris, sir, I'm deeply touched with all the kind words you said. I can tell you I represent here the scientific community of the world. And our attempt is to bring out the truth of climate change. And indeed, that is what we've been trying to do. But truth is not always accepted painlessly. Sometimes the acceptance of truth involves a lot of pain. And it is the words and encouragement of a leader like you that give me strength and in turn give strength to the scientific community. I'm also very grateful to Her Excellency Madame Patricia Espinoza for the remarkable leadership she has shown. I have seen how tirelessly in the past few months she has been traveling all over the world to mobilize public opinion, to understand how one can bring about some forward movement in Cancun. And as she rightly said, Cancun is not the end of the world. Cancun is an important milestone in progress that the world has to make. And I would like to pay my tribute to you, Madam, for your leadership. We all feel that Cancun will be a great event that would show that the world is serious about dealing with climate change. My best wishes to Mr. Johan Kloss, who you have taken over charge of an organization that has huge potential. And I think with your experience, and your background, sir, one couldn't think of better leadership for that organization than what you would provide. May I say urbanization is going to be the key in defining the solutions to deal with climate change. In 2030, it is expected that 60% of the world's population will be living in urban areas and close to 80% in Europe. And there would be a large percentage in North America as well. And therefore, clearly, urban areas have to be an important part of the solution. May I say that there is a larger purpose and a much larger objective in bringing about a transformation that Mayor Delano and Mayor um, Ebrard talked about. We have to bring about a shift to a sustainable pattern of development. Historically, when human society was essentially rural in its character and personality. We had a much deeper connection with nature because we survived on the ecosystem services provided by nature. And therefore, we could see, we could visualize, we could feel what nature provides to us for our welfare. Urbanization has somehow disconnected that relationship. And therefore, it is really for the leadership and the citizenry of urban areas to now see that there is no way that we cannot be responsible to the protection 
and the conservation of nature. In this regard, may I also mention that if you look at the emissions of carbon dioxide, almost 80% can be accounted for in terms of urban activities. So therefore, we clearly have enormous potential and most importantly, we have almost a duty and a responsibility to see that we reduce this ecological footprint that urban activities have been imposing on the ecosystems of this planet. I also want to highlight that the impacts of climate change will leave large parts of the world extremely vulnerable. Most important are the small island states who are facing the problem of sea level rise. During the 20th century, we have seen sea level rise increase by uh, reach the level of about 17 centimeters on an average. Of course, it varies from place to place, but that essentially is the average. And you can imagine those societies who are living on islands which are barely a meter above sea level are clearly vulnerable to any weather event that takes place because with a higher sea level, the impacts are certainly substantially worse than if the sea level had remained constant. I also want to mention the fact that there are parts of cities, the mega deltas in particular, and this includes cities like Shanghai, Dhaka, Kolkata, where you have a large concentration of population living in the deltaic areas of those parts of the world. Every time there is coastal flooding, every time there is a storm surge, a large number of people are vulnerable and a substantial amount of property is also at risk. There are parts of sub-Saharan Africa which are particularly vulnerable. But may I say nobody is going to be safe from the impacts of climate change. Even in those societies which are relatively prosperous, the impacts of climate change will certainly affect some vulnerable sections of society. And these include the elderly, these include the underprivileged, and those who are marginalized. Take the example of what happened in the city of New Orleans with Hurricane Katrina. Who were the worst affected? The poorest of the poor. Who lost lives and property? The poorest of the poor. And for us to believe that, for instance, on this continent, we are safe from the impacts of climate change would be a mistake. Our projections in the IPCC have clearly shown that water problems, for instance, in the western part of North America are going to be certainly more severe in the future. If you look at globally what the impacts of climate change would do, they would certainly affect availability of water. As a matter of fact, as early as 2020, anywhere from 75 to 250 million people in Africa will be living in a state of water stress. And some of them will not be able to get enough water to meet their very basic biological needs. So that's clearly not a situation that we would like to see. And it's a situation which cannot keep us insulated from what's going to happen in another part of the world. We also know that food supply would be affected because the impacts of climate change on agriculture can be quite serious. Of course, there are some parts of the world that might that might see an improvement in agricultural productivity, but the net impact we can project will be negative. And therefore, food security, particularly for the poorest of the poor, will become a serious issue. I would also like to highlight the impacts of climate change on human health. This would arise largely because we would have more frequent floods, drought, heat waves, and extreme precipitation events. That means large quantities of rainfall or snow in short periods of time. But there will also be increase in vector-borne diseases. So I think cities can take a lead in providing better health care, in providing proper information to the citizens, because I want to emphasize the importance of adaptation to the impacts of climate change. Whatever we do today, even if we were to reduce emissions, to a level which actually are lower than what we have today, 
the impacts of climate change will continue for a few decades. So the world has no choice but to adapt to these impacts. And cities and the leadership of cities can play an extremely important role in putting in place these adaptation measures. Which is not to say that adaptation is not taking place today. It is. But we need to create capacity. We need to ensure that we create knowledge on the possible impacts in the future. We integrate adaptation measures with development policies and we improve governance so that communities can be mobilized on a far more effective basis than we have been able to in the past. Now, before I end, I also want to clearly point out the responsibility of cities to mitigate the emissions of greenhouse gases. There are huge opportunities in the transport sector. And the two mayors who have just spoken before me have done remarkable things in bringing about a transformation of, trans of transportation in their cities. And this has huge benefits for a large section of the population. We cannot have a transport system which is polluting, which is leading to emissions of greenhouse gases, and which is only exclusive for the benefit of the richest sections of society. Transportation has to meet the needs of the poor, the lower middle classes, and everybody on an equitable basis. So it's important to remember that these mitigation measures also have huge co-benefits. It's not only for global reasons that we need to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and bring about a restructuring of the transport sector. There are enormous local benefits in terms of lower levels of air pollution at the local level and therefore health benefits, much greater employment, and most certainly the reduced impacts of climate change uh, to which all of us would be subjected. There is, there is great, great opportunity in the building sector. My own institute in New Delhi has been doing pioneering work in the design and construction of buildings and retrofitting of existing buildings. And this has to be done at the level of cities and towns. We also know that we would need to create capacity to bring about some of these changes. And here may I say, the small towns and the less uh, fortunate uh, habitats across the world would need capability and capacity to be established whereby they can take some of these measures. And here I would like to raise a question which I hope will be discussed in this extremely uh, powerful conference, this group that we have here. How do we ensure that there is some kind of a global fund that could be set up whereby towns and cities are able to create capacity, are able to take measures and take steps by which they become a part of the global solution and by which they ensure that the lives of citizens under their charge can be improved to a level where we all feel proud of the direction that we have taken and to a level where we can say the world is moving to a pattern of sustainable development. And I would like to end by quoting Mahatma Gandhi, a great inspiration for the world today. Here was a thin, ill-fed person who hardly wore any clothes, but he had the courage of his convictions. He believed in truth and he made sure that he could bring about a major revolution without a single shot being fired, bring about a non-violent struggle against what he considered is wrong. And I think all of us need to adopt that kind of philosophy. And as Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. Thank you very much.